All right, our final keynote speakers for this morning are Melissa Roth and Vince Rue. Melissa and Vince are co-founders and lead researchers at Off Planet Research, where they are researching extraterrestrial environments and regolith simulants. Yesterday, Vince talked about lunar ice, and today, Melissa is going to present on lunar regolith later. But right now, they're going to talk about lunar regolith, optimizing a challenge. Wonderful. Okay, can everyone see me and uh, hopefully in a second a PowerPoint? Yep, it's looking good. Okay, wonderful. Perfect. And if my slides don't advance, please let me know. Um, they should go pretty quick. So, hello, my name is Melissa Roth, and I am one of the founders and lead researchers at Off Planet Re Research, located in Washington State. I want to thank the Moon Society for having me today. We've already heard some great presentations on regolith and ISRU. Today I'll be speaking about lunar regolith, the challenge it presents to humans and robotic missions, and how lunar regolith and the resources within it can be leveraged to help sustain a long-term presence on the moon and in deeper space. Off-planet research things extraterrestrial environments for testing spacecraft and landed technology with a current focus on the lunar environment. As engineers, we know how important testing and good testing materials are for increasing mission assurance, cost effectiveness, and to speed the development of space-based technologies. OPR was founded in 2015 and spent several years developing our lunar regolith simulant production methods to mimic the natural formation processes on the moon as most commercial crushing equipment tends to smooth or round the particles and contribute high levels of contamination. In addition to our lunar regolith simulants, we have also developed lunar icy regolith simulants that include the nine components found in the L-cross plume. In addition to consulting on working with lunar regolith and conducting component testing, we are also developing our own technology, such as self-cleaning, dust-proof fluid and gas connectors. You may have heard from my colleague Vince yesterday, so please bear with me if a few of these initial slides sound familiar. To clarify some terminology, regolith is a geology term referring to the layer of unconsolidated rocky material covering bedrock and is used to describe the soil on the moon and other planetary bodies. Lunar regolith simulants are materials that are made on Earth to simulate or replicate the regolith found on the moon to be used in research and testing due to the scarcity and protection of returned lunar samples. The environment on the moon is one of the most challenging that humanity has ever encountered. In addition to extreme temperatures of plus or minus 260 degrees Fahrenheit, one of the most difficult parts of this environment is the nature of the regolith on the moon. Earth's soil contains organic material and the particles are formed by wind blown and water processes, which makes them relatively round and smooth. The particles on airless bodies, such as the moon, have no organics, are not altered by moisture and are entirely formed by impact and explosive processes. This means that these particles are very hard and covered in fractured surfaces with sharp edges, such as you can see in the middle, uh, the image in the middle. The regolith on the moon is very destructive and hazardous to both humans and technology. It is abrasive like sandpaper and very susceptible to static charge due to its high surface area. Additionally, more than 60% of the regolith on the moon is composed of particles that are quite fine, like those in talcum powder or cake flour. Due to all of these factors, regolith particles easily get into spacesuit joints or moving mechanisms of rovers and cause them to seize up. Considering how short their missions were, the astronauts' gloves and suits suffered a lot of damage. The Earth is protected from most meteors because they burn up when they enter our atmosphere. Those that do get through radically change the landscape, like the upper photo which shows Meteor Crater in Arizona. The moon has no atmosphere, so even tiny micrometeorites hit the surface, making their own little craters that behave just like their larger relatives. This is how rocks on the lunar surface get crushed into a very fine powder. Additionally, the energy of the impact melts some of the surrounding regolith, which quickly cools and glues to other regolith particles, forming a glutenitz, which you can see in the lower left-hand image. Due to the structure of a glutenitz, they have a significant effect on the mechanical properties of lunar regolith. When you look at the moon, you can see the light and dark patches. 
When Galileo looked at the moon through a telescope in 1609, he thought the dark patches looked like smooth bodies of water, which he called mare, an Italian word for ocean. When he studied the lighter parts of the moon, they looked rugged like the mountains on Earth, so he called them the highlands. These are the names we still use today. The soil in the darker colored mare is composed mostly of basalt, as seen in the photo of our mare simulant on the left. The simulant on the right is representative of the lighter highlands, which are made mostly of a rocks called anorthosite. Basalt is commonly found all over Earth. However, some terrestrial basalts are a better match for lunar basalt than others. A chain anorthosite is not very common on Earth and is more than 3.5 billion years old. When the Earth was cooling down from a ball of molten rock, this anorthosite was one of the first materials that solidified and floated to the surface. When you think about the moon, I imagine the view of the moon on the left is the image that comes to mind for most of you. What many people do not realize is how different the far side of the moon looks. There are very few mare patches on the far side of the moon. And while the lunar highlands cover almost 80% of the lunar surface, most lunar missions have landed in the mare regions. Due to the communication challenges between Earth and the far side, only one mission has landed there, and it was a Chinese rover, in, uh, rover and lander in 2019. In this iconic photo of Buzz Aldrin on the left, you'll note how white his suit is, with the exception of a couple dark spots on his knees from a fall. On the right, James Irwin's bottom half is absolutely coated in dark gray regolith. Not only is the regolith abrasive and destructive to fabrics and joints, but the astronauts were susceptible to overheating as the pristine white design was meant to help reflect heat. And I do just want to note how dangerous it is for astronauts like Buzz to fall, and yet he was not the only one to do so. Given the nature of regolith and rocks, falling into this sharp abrasive material could ruin the suit and put the mission and the astronaut's life at risk especially if they are not near a lander or habitat when it happens. The ability of astronauts to both move freely and safely while wearing a suit is something that cannot be overlooked. A new dust generating system arrived on the moon starting with Apollo 15 in the form of the lunar roving vehicle. While these LRVs dramatically increased the distance traveled and mission capabilities they also stirred up even more lunar dust to coat the LRV, the astronauts, and their instruments. In regards to cleaning their suits after each EVA, Gene Cernan said, probably the most difficult job of all the closeouts was trying to dust the suits. And in the photo on the right, a very dirty Gene Cernan can be seen in the lunar module after taking off his suit. And what I find fascinating about this photo is that theoretically, Gene was protected from the regolith in his EVA suit. His skin was never exposed to the regolith outside the lunar module. The suits being dirty makes sense, while the astronauts who were inside them, less so. And despite all the time spent cleaning, the regolith that did enter the lunar module quickly dispersed around the capsule. Many astronauts developed lunar hay fever as a result of breathing in these fine abrasive particles. In fact, researchers are now studying how long-term exposure to lunar dust might affect the lungs of future astronauts. This table shows some of the statistics of the Apollo EVAs. The six missions over three and a half years show a rapid advancement in the amount of time spent outside the lunar module, total distance traveled, and the quantity of samples brought back. The addition of the lunar roving vehicle drastically increased the distance covered by Apollo astronauts and thus the variety of samples brought back. That said, the longest astronauts have spent on the lunar surface is less than 24 hours. If the dust was so abrasive that it wore through three layers of the Kevlar-like material on Jack Schmidt's boots, how will our technology survive three uh, months to weeks on the lunar surface? I imagine if you are attending this conference, you likely know that many national space agencies and private organizations have a vision for a long-term sustainable presence on the moon and in deeper space. With almost 50 years since the last human mission to the moon, how can we make these visions a reality? 
NASA's solution is the Artemis program, a series of missions with the goal of landing the first woman and the next man on the moon by 2024. The first phase of this ambitious program will be with several smaller landed missions, transition to larger vehicles with deployable rovers and culminate in a crewed mission to the lunar south pole in 2024. The second phase will build upon the first to increase mission capabilities for Mars missions. So normally industry struggles with bridging the gap between technology and business. And while still applicable for the space industry, the bigger struggle is about bridging the gap between technology designed for environments on Earth and technology designed for the moon and other worlds, of which we often have incomplete or little knowledge. These unknowns are called strategic knowledge gaps or SKGs. These are questions that researchers and industry experts try to answer ahead of time or plan to answer through a mission. One such knowledge gap is dust mitigation. As I mentioned earlier, Apollo era technology had issues operating in the dusty environments on the lunar surface and kind of just had to live with it. Well, for that vision of humans inhabiting the moon, you can't just live with the dust. We need to either prevent dust from collecting on surfaces in the first place, or we need to create new technology that is more durable for this harsh environment. So let's look first at some Apollo era dust mitigation strategies. In addition to procedural mitigation techniques, cleaning processes, and strict planning to avoid hazards, astronauts use dust brushes, dust covers, and rover fenders to reduce or remove dust. Now, the problem with a brush is that it often creates static. With particles that are very fine and susceptible to static charge, these brushes are only marginally effective, as is evident by my earlier mention of Jean's appearance and the comment about the time the astronauts spent trying to dust themselves off. What happens when a vital component breaks on the moon and the closest hardware store is 239,000 miles away? Well, there are several instances of life and mission-threatening breaks during the Apollo missions, but one almost prevented the final two lunar roving EVAs of the Apollo era. At the end of the first Apollo 17 EVA, Gene Cernan's hammer caught the edge of a fender and it popped off. Without the fender extension protecting them from the dust, driving the LRV was a serious hazard. Due to 16G, any lofted dust goes much further than it would on Earth. The astronauts described riding the fen without the fender extension as causing these massive rooster tails. And this lofted, lofted dust spread all over their instruments and suits. So as the dust is darker than the instruments and the astronauts' bright white suits, the dust absorbed heat from the sun and could overheat the instruments as well as the astronauts. While the astronauts slept, the team in Houston had to rapidly create a replacement fender using only the materials the astronauts had on the moon. Their solution was to attach four of the 28 lunar maps with duct tape and two alignment telescopes as seen in that middle photo. I think this is an amazing story that illustrates the importance of thinking on your feet, adapting technology, and learning, how to experience, uh, learning from experience how to mitigate dust. Because without this fix, the only geologist to ever set foot on the moon might not have had the opportunity to discover orange glassy regolith on the edge of Shorty Crater during the second EVA. With missions launching soon, both nationally and internationally, new dust mitigation techniques are needed. We need optical systems, such as camera lenses, solar panels, and spacesuit visors. We need advanced fabrics for spacesuits, habitats, and covers. Thermal radiators and painted surfaces will help with heat reduction. Dust tolerant mechanisms like linear actuators, bearings, rotary joints, hinges, and quick disconnects are necessary for technology longevity. New seals and soft goods for spacesuit interfaces, hatches, connectors, and hoses are also very acceptable to abrasion and need further testing. Offplanet Research is one of the newest SBIR awardees to help advance one of these technologies, and so we're really excited to see where that goes. So going back to that vision of the lunar village, we've studied the environment, we developed new dust mitigation technologies that work great, and we're launching missions on a regular basis. Wonderful. Now we need to go back to that business case we set aside earlier. Science and research goals can only fund so many missions. Governments can only fund 
so many missions. It would be hard to make the case for a lunar or Martian village without being able to show the financials of why we need to go and not just why we want to go. This is where lunar resources come into play. We need to be able to use the resources on the moon, Mars, and asteroids to literally propel ourselves into deeper space. This all starts with the idea of resource util uh, in situ resource utilization or ISRU. ISRU being the idea of living off the land and using the resources around you. There are many resources that can be extracted from regolith and used on the surface. Lunar regolith is at least 40% oxygen by mass and silicate minerals make up over 90% of the moon. There are a variety of metals and creep components, that's potassium, rare earth elements, and phosphorus, in the regolith as well. Volatiles refers to the frozen components that have been discovered in lunar ice. In, 2009, Elcross, in the 2009 Elcross mission, NASA crashed a satellite into the South Pole and discovered water, carbon dioxide, ammonia, and methane, to name a few, in that ejecta plume. Elcross estimates estimated about 5.5 weight percent in, of water in addition to the other volatiles, while spectral modeling actually estimates up to 30 weight percent ice. With one data point of ground truth, there are many unknowns for volatiles, but they have revolutionized how lunar resources can be used. For example, oxygen and hydrogen can be used in rocket fuel, breathable air, drinking water, and in agriculture. The rare earth elements that are in their unrefined state on the moon can be exported back to Earth to be used in many applications like electronics. Raw or processed regolith can be used in sintering or 3D printing applications to make tools and construct buildings, protective thermal and impact shields, and roads. Earlier I mentioned there were a lot of unknowns about volatiles in the lunar polar regions. The largest supply of volatiles that is most easily accessible from the surface is expected to be in the permanently shadowed regions where the sunlight never hits. These regions at the North or South Pole are often in or at the edge of craters and are ultra cold at minus 260 degrees Fahrenheit or even colder in certain craters. Early missions to the polar regions will send prospecting instruments and rovers like NASA's Viper rover to head into these extreme access environments to categorize and map the distribution of volatiles in preparation for future excavation and extraction missions. Later missions will utilize these resources to create a robust infrastructure on the lunar surface. Back to the business case. In order for ISRU and particularly lunar rocket fuel to make sense financially, it needs to be less expensive to source propellant from the moon than to launch it from Earth and there needs to be a market. With the recent flurry of mission planning to the moon and deeper space by commercial industry and national and international government agencies, that market has mostly been defined. The biggest delta V is getting out, out of Earth's atmosphere. Once you're out of LEO, the delta V significantly reduces and each kilogram of propellant is more efficient. If the cost of the propellant obtained from the moon to low Earth orbit, or LEO, is, the cost, is less than the cost to ship the propellant from LEO to Earth, the business case can be closed. Refueling upper stages in LEO can transport heavy payloads from LEO to GEO and beyond. And this can increase the affordability of NASA's activities on the moon, ESA's moon village, and missions to Mars. While the savings depend on the in-space transportation approach and assumptions, there's now a big business case to be made for sourcing propellant in space. And for more information about kind of the propellant and ISRU, um, there have been some great presentations previously, and I highly recommend if you didn't see them, you go back and, and check them out after the fact. Um, they go a lot more in depth than I can in my, my time. So a 2019 WGM research, uh, research report has been released on a conceptual economic study on mining water on the moon. They see the market as encompassing satellite refueling, the International Space Station and Lunar Gateway, moon and Mars bases, space agriculture, and tourism and hotels. They're valuing this market at $206 billion over the next 30 years. The moon is a stepping stone to the rest of the universe, but it should not be overlooked for the science and the resources that it offers in its own right. By developing lunar resources, colonizing space becomes more profitable and desirable. And regolith 
which is one of the biggest nuisances and hazards of the moon, might just be the very reason humanity can envision thriving, a thriving economy in space. Ultimately, the reason for becoming a multi-planet civilization is to better the lives of everyone and ensure the survival of humanity. As we begin the next stage of space development, we need to ensure that we work to make this vision a reality while not repeating the errors of our past. And learning to survive and thrive on the moon is our first step towards this new existence. In the future, there will be thousands of people working and living in space. This is the beginning of the next great human adventure. I thank you for your time and I welcome any questions at this point. Great. Thanks, Melissa. That was a great presentation. So we've got a, a few questions. Uh, is there a variety in the regolith composition from one location to another? Yeah, so there I mentioned the two main types of, of soil on the moon, the, the mare and the highland. Well, Within each region, there is actually quite a lot of variety. That was something that the Apollo missions and other, other landed missions noted is that you can pick up um, a sample from one location and travel you know, a few meters and all of a sudden you're, you have a different composition. Um, additionally, there are, are areas that have pyroclastic deposits, so those are kind of like extra glass, um, such as the orange soils that uh, Jack Schmidt found in Apollo 17. And so there's quite a lot of variety. Um, and then you also have the difference between the near side highland and the far side highland. Going back to that, that map um, that I showed of, of both the near side and the far side, you saw on the far side, there was a lot less mare um, patches. There, there wasn't as much of that dark basaltic material on the surface. And so because of that, you have less impact gardening, which is going to mix the mare and the, the highland together and kind of create something that is a, a little bit of a mixture of both. Um, that's why, you know, if you go to the mare or you go to the highland, you're going to get both a northlicite and basalt due to that mixing. Um, so yes, it's very important to, to know about the location that missions are going to um, so that we can plan well for um, the testing materials. And, and be prepared for, for what's gonna be there and any, any variety that you're gonna experience from traveling to different, different surfaces. Excellent. Um, Shia Mohan asks, how do you get the information about the regolith for simulation where no lander or rover has gone? For example, the lunar South Pole. Yeah, that is a great question. Um, again, going to back to that map of the near side and the far side, we really had most of our missions clustered around the, the equatorial region on the near side. Um, so we have ground truth from, from those locations. However, um, most information that we actually have about composition is from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, or LRO. And the LRO is a, an amazing um, piece of technology that was launched back at the same time as the LCROSS mission I mentioned earlier. And LRO has been operating now long past its projected lifetime. Um, and so I think it's now in like year 11. Um, so it has been orbiting the moon and they use what little fuel they have left to occasionally change how it, um, it, its orbit so it can document the different locations on the moon. So we actually have some pretty good imaging. Now, again, it's, it's still remote sensing imaging. And so we don't have um, quite the, the small scale figured out and some of the mineralogy will be best verified from, from land admissions, but it really gives us a good idea of, of what to expect ahead of time. And then refinement can be used after, after land admissions. Great. Uh, Chris Wolf asks, is water or soap and water effective at removing regolith dust from suit materials? And if not, how is simulant production equipment cleaned? You know, I think that this is one of those things that, that people are still researching um, as well. And I, I think one thing to keep in mind is that, yes, water is really good at kind of separating dust from um, any surface. That's why it's recommended you wash your hands for 20 seconds right now. Um, at, at the minimum with lots of, of rubbing to try and, and reduce any uh, germs on your hand. It's kind of the same idea. Um, however, I'd also like to, to remind everyone that water is going to be a scarce commodity on the lunar surface, even after, you know, ISRU is, is in place and we're, we're sourcing water and all these other volatiles. Um, I, I still think it's going to be 
a very hot commodity. And so you're gonna wanna be very careful with how much water you're using. And if you're using water to clean, then that water is very dirty. Um, and so if you're gonna then reuse it for anything, you're gonna have to filter it or distill it, um, which is, is kind of its own, um, its own struggles and, and takes time and resources to do. So um, I, I think that's a great question. And I think that's why a lot of people are looking into different technologies um, because brushes were only marginally effective. Calvin Gluck wants to know, are you able to share any knowledge or thoughts about agricultural research using lunar or Martian regolith simulants? Do you know if it makes any sense to try to grow plants and food in regolith versus hydroponic methods? Yeah, and I think that that's a great question, Calvin. I know we briefly discussed it yesterday in the networking session. Um, but yes, there's lots of research being done on agriculture, specifically using regolith. Um, again, if you're going to be on the lunar surface, regolith is one thing that is not in short supply. And so being able to utilize it as a growth media is a fascinating and I think very important research area. Now, a couple of things are you've spent millions or billions of dollars building a habitat on the lunar surface with the best technology known to man at dust mitigation and air filtration so that the astronauts aren't tracking dust all over the habitat. Well, the last thing they're gonna do then is bring in raw regolith from the surface, at least in our, our humble opinion. Um, they're not gonna bring in raw regolith and you know with all of the fines and, and dump that into the greenhouse. There's probably gonna have to be a sorting method or some way to really keep the, the dust down. Um, I, I also worry about due to the density of the, the fine particles, I'm not sure it would allow much root, root, root growth. And so being able to kind of play with that particle size distribution to, to really see what particle, uh, plants need to grow is important. Looking at, do we need to have like some pioneer plants to prep the soil? Do we need to bring fertilizers until you have a couple generations and the soil is a little bit more hospitable? Um, other questions are, does it grow better in mare or highland? Um, we've done a little work ourselves and spoiler alert, yes, it does grow better in one than the other. Um, again, at least from preliminary, preliminary studies. And so um, I think it's a very interesting question and one that uh, is being addressed and is going to need to be addressed for long-term um, sustainable presence on, on the moon or other worlds. I hope I answered that, Calvin. Please let me know if I missed part of it. I think it was a great answer. Um, Bill Krantz asks, can different size versions of a shop vac be utilized to collect or groom the spacesuits and equipment from, of the regolith? I'm sorry, did you say like a shop vac? Basically, yeah, like a, some kind of shop vac. So can we vacuum the dust off the equipment? Yeah, I mean, hey Roomba, if you're looking for a new market, uh, please, please reach out. No, um, I do think that we're gonna have to really get creative in how to reduce dust. And earlier I mentioned, you know, you kind of have to take two mottos, either prevent it in the first place or learn how to to, to live with it and have technologies that are more robust. I really think it's actually gonna be a combination of both of them. And I think there's gonna be multiple layers within that just because of how abrasive this is, just because of how much it likes to spread and get everywhere. Um, I mean, our, our, our lab can attest to that. Our, our poor computers um, that aren't in the dusty environment, I'm sure have dust in them. And so uh, it, it's really important to kind of think about all of those characteristics. And I think, you know, vacuum cleaners make sense. I see in the comment section, uh, blowers could also be effective. Again, it depends on where you are. If you're inside, you're probably not gonna wanna blow the dust around. If you're outside, you wanna be careful about where you're blowing the dust. Um, Cause again, it, it gets lofted very easily and it likes to stay lofted. I was equating it yesterday to, um, you know, I live in Seattle, so the firework display that we have around the Space Needle every year. After about halfway, all of a sudden, especially if there's low cloud cover, that, that smoky haze blocks a lot of the other fireworks. Or again, in Washington, when Mount St. Helens erupted, that's kind of an extreme example, but that dust, uh, the, the volcanic ash, just littered the entire planet for, for days. Um, so I think what will be really interesting is when there are multiple missions, potentially on a daily or weekly or monthly basis, how that's going to affect lofted dust and, and how much is going to, to stay lofted, how much might escape and head into deeper space. Um, and I think it'll be very interesting. 
Oh, absolutely. Uh, Arvin Tan would like to know, is it expensive to make Lunar Regolith Simulate? Do you see any commercial applications for its abrasive features? Um, uh, it, again, it depends on the simulant. So we offer, I, I, if you are particularly interested, please feel free to contact us outside of um, the chat. If you go to our, our website, you can get us our emails or my email is melissa at offplanetresearch.com. Um, so I don't go too much into that. But we offer a variety of simulants, um, for everything from geared towards agricultural research, again, without some of those finer particles, to materials that are more appropriate for mechanical testing where morphology and particle size distribution, flow characteristics are very important, um, but also looking at mineralogy so that you have proper feedstocks for, for more chemical processes. Um, ISRU extraction is really important. Um, and so depending on the type of simulant that's being produced, that, that will affect the cost. Um, the finer particles that are very prevalent in, in standard lunar regolith are very expensive to make, um, in part because they're abrasive, which means when you're sifting them, they like to cling to one another or get into the little grooves. And so you really have to uh, sieve them quite, quite aggressively. Um, and they don't like to sieve because the, the other thing about the particles is they're not really round. So their aspect ratio, they can be longer in one direction and shorter in the other. Um, which means they're going to sort um, a little bit differently um, depending on which uh, side is going through the sieve. And the other thing is you don't really want a wet sieve because that's going to alter um, the, the kind of more the geology uh, properties of, of the simulant. And so you really want to avoid that. Um, so, I mean, those are things to consider on the moon as well. And that's, I mean, on the moon, you have to consider reduced gravity. At least gravity is a, a help here on Earth. And Ben, I'm sorry, there was a secondary question. I think it had to do with abrasion. Yeah, it said, uh, do you see any commercial applications for its abrasive features? Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, you could use a simulant or, or something similar to simulant um, in any sort of abrasion test, blasting. Um, I'm sure it would make a very effective blast uh, media. And so uh, I think there's lots of applications um, I think there's also a lot of applications for any dust uh, mitigation technologies here on Earth. And I think that that's something that shouldn't be overlooked as well, is how can all these technologies we're developing for the moon be utilized here on Earth? Um, whether that's dust mitigation for um, remote access or dusty you know, environments or arid regions. How can we utilize um, ISRU uh, water collection or filtration? How can we use dust mitigation or, you know, again, uh, heavy, heavier duty materials for abrasion? I think it's, it's going to be really interesting to see how technologies for other planets can really revolutionize life here on Earth as well. Yep, absolutely. Uh, Joseph Cunningham asks, what low gravity, low water refinement processes have been proven for metal processing on the moon? Oh. That, that might, I might not be the most appropriate person to answer that. Vince, feel free to, to jump in if you have something specific to say. I think that it's something that is going to be, again, further developed as, as time proceeds. Um, I, I know that there are organizations working on it. Um, we've worked with a couple of organizations that we know are, are doing it. Um, and so I think it's gonna be really important because again, any water that you use on the moon, they're gonna want to reuse and reuse and reuse as much as humanly possible. Um, and so filtration is going to be absolutely key. Yeah, uh, I think you're you're right about that. You want to stay away from using water as a uh, as a primary component of any kind of industrial process. It's it has a lot more valuable uses on the moon than that. Uh, gravity is going to affect uh, things like um, the buoyancy. So if you're using buoyancy to uh, separate up materials in a crucible, then you're going to have to allow some extra time for that to happen. Um, but the uh, the real people who talk about that, the real experts, are going to be the people that we work with um, that are doing uh, research and development on uh, metal extraction, that sort of thing. They'd be better uh, better qualified to answer that question. Our our job is to to provide them with what they need so they can do their research. We're not the ones that actually do that. But great question, um, and yep. again, that's something that really is going to need more more research and further development as we get ready for those missions. Oh, definitely. Uh, Bill Clausen 
would like to know how close does your company's regolith duplicate the abrasiveness of actual lunar regolith? Um, we, we believe in our humble opinion that it is pretty abrasive. Um, we spend a lot of, of time um, really researching the natural formation processes on the moon and how we can replicate those down here uh, on earth to really keep that high particle angularity, which again increases the surface area and the abrasion um, without then contributing high levels of contamination. Um, and so that was something we, we really focus on. Um, the, the big three, as I call them, in a simulant that you want to look for and that you know, we, we work on is the particle morphology, the particle size distribution, so having a range from the larger particles down to those ultra fines, and then the uh, mineralogy, so sourcing of good feedstocks. And again, I'm, I'm happy to talk in more detail outside of, of this as well. Great. Uh, Jesse would like to know, when thinking of water extraction on the moon and splitting it into its uh, constituent elements, hydrogen and oxygen, what are your thoughts on containing them as a gas via cryogenic systems? So I think the biggest thing is going to be the temperature. Um, when and where are you, are you doing the extraction? Because I'm assuming you're going to use the ambient temperature and based off daytime temperatures that it probably it's going to be a gas um and so i think that I, I don't see an issue with that um i think what's going to be really interesting and really important for isru processors is ensuring how their process is going to take off these different components um it's not like you heat it up to a, a certain temperature and all of a sudden all the methane comes off and you heat it a little bit more and all the carbon dioxide comes off and you heat it a little more and all the water comes off um, it, it kind of comes off in, in, in clumps, especially depending on the thickness of the layer. And so it's going to be really important that you don't have interaction between the gases. Um, from experience, hydrogen sulfide and ammonia do not make a very fun um, experience. Um, and that's in an open air environment. I can't imagine in a closed uh, canister what that might do. Um, so I think that as well is very interesting. Great. Uh, John Jossi asks, has research been done using simulants to validate flight-ready hardware that could be used for extraction and collection of water from the regolith? Flight-ready hardware. Um, I know it's being done with, you know, a lot of processes that are in development or now are prototyping and they're starting to do um, you know, some of the, the vomit comet or reduced gravity uh, experiments. I'm not sure, Vince, can you think of any that are uh, flight ready at this point in time? Oh, uh, wow. Again, that might be left to uh, the experts to determine uh, what is considered flight ready. Yeah, there's, there's some, that particular question, uh, Equipment developers tend to be very protective of their processes and IP and what stage they're at. I mean, uh, if it's part of a NASA contract, eventually it becomes public, but they don't like to talk about it. And we also are very sensitive to that with our clients, so we don't talk about that as well. Um, it's, it's, it's a sensitive topic. Uh, what we can say is that we do provide our stimulants to people that are doing research that is leading to flight ready hardware and what stage they're at is uh, something that we and they probably do not want to have released to the public. Yep, completely understandable. Uh, just as a note, John Jossi will be presenting about solutions to lunar dust today in track two at 3.30. Yep, that's gonna be a good one to listen to. Yep. Uh, Molly Kamide asks, what methods are used to mitigate kicking up dust on the moon for rovers and humans? Uh, again, I think there's going to be a variety of techniques. And again, Vince, feel free to jump in. Um, I mean, the fenders, I, I gave the story of a fender that unfortunately uh, failed, but then was able to be mostly fixed. Um, so it's going to be technologies as simple as that, kind of what we use here on, on Earth, just adapted for the larger scale. Um, I think you're also going to have to, again, be careful about where if there's any sort of um, plume exhaust, exhaust or there's any gas blowing. You just want to be careful about 
where you're directing it, the last thing you want to do is touch down on the surface and eject um, uh, some gas and have it coat your cameras that are on the underside of the lander. Um, I think that that would be uh, very unfortunate um, if you got all the way there and then at the last, last moment, your cameras now have a, a lovely film over them. Um, so I think that's gonna be really important. Again, I think those are technologies that are being further refined and further developed. Um, and it'll look, I think, very similar, especially generation one and two to Apollo, and then hopefully become a little bit more robust as, as time and confidence and knowledge uh, goes on. Yeah, something about the rovers, uh, the wheels can be really touchy because you want to save as much weight as possible. So the tendency for the rover wheels is to use a sort of a wire mesh approach for shaping those wheels. Uh, unfortunately, those, uh, as was uh, demonstrated by the Apollo lunar rovers are really great at uh, kicking up a lot of dust. So you, there's a trade-off, a lot of research being done in the design for wheels. But also, we don't need to travel, at least not right now, we don't need to travel a 30 miles per hour over the lunar surface, and it's probably not good for research anyway. Um, so the speed that you need to traverse has a lot to do with it as well. Um, so th there's a lot to be considered in that, but it is certainly something that they're paying attention to. Yeah, so the techniques and pre procedures are almost as important right now as the technology that's being developed itself. Yep, yeah. yep, absolutely. Uh, Rosalie Dietman asks, given that calcium powder is implicated in ovarian cancer, what effect might regolith have on future cancers? Ooh. Yeah, again, I think this is an area best left to the experts. I, I mentioned that there's research being done, and I think has been done for, for many years, on the effects of regolith on the lungs. Um, I'd say that's clearly the, the more immediate one. However, I think it's also going to be important, especially for anyone that settles there for, for months to years, or potentially we've heard several, several presentations retiring to the moon with their families. Um, it's going to be extremely important to, to look into those aspects as well. And that's a great thing about space is it's very interdisciplinary. You have everyone from biologists to chemists to geologists to agriculturalists um, and to rocket scientists. And I think we all need to kind of look at some of those big ideas, those long term um, concerns uh, now. So then again, we can prepare for them. Um, so much like having the, the centrifuge um, to help with the gravity, um, we might need to look into technologies that can help against cancers as well, or you know, other effects on a very uh, a planetary body that gets a lot of radiation. Yep, yeah, a, lot of, a lot of things we have to prepare for. Uh, Joseph Cunningham asks, what type of instrumentation would be most useful in verifying mineral content of regolith or substrata via a surface prospecting mission to verify or expand upon existing remote sensing data? Um, I mean, there's, there's a lot of spectrometers that are expected to go, instruments that are expected to go on early missions. Um, so one of them is the near infrared, hold on, the near infrared volatile spectrometer subsystem or NERVIS. Um, that was is it a spectrometer that was uh, is PI'd by the same PI as LCROSS, uh, Tony Colapri, out of NASA Ames, and it's being uh, sent purely to look for volatiles. So really being able to characterize both in the polar regions and even in the equatorial regions, what what is the spectrometer picking up um, from the surface? But you also have other other systems that are going to need to be able to go that. We're going to want them to go a little bit deeper than the surface and so that's going to require you know different wavelengths and whatnot to really be able to penetrate um, deeper down not only for volatiles but also for for regolith i know there's a lot of interest in the regolith below you know the top uh you know few centimeters let alone meters really starting to get down into the geology um, of, of the formation of the moon um, and how that might influence our knowledge about the solar system as a whole. One thing I'd like to interject there is that uh, direct observations are always the best. So if you could find a way of uh, putting a shaft down into the regolith and then directly observing it, and, and particularly a shaft that will not uh, disturb or mix in a lot of the, uh, uh, the various strata in the regolith would be the best way to do that. We do have some stuff that we've been working on for that as well, but uh, that's the best way to do is direct observation. Oh, 
cool thing. Um, David Chevron asks, is there anything we can do to get people to correctly use the term soil in reference only to growth media and not inorganic dirt? So this is a touchy subject um, with, with certain people in the industry. We, to me, dirt is the dirtiest word. I'd rather they use soil than dirt, just because to me, dirt has bugs, organics, microbes. Um, but yeah, the same, same goes for soil. Um, and I, I think it's really gonna be between the geologists and the non-geologists. Um, that, that's where a lot of the terminology kind of can differ. Um, and so I, I think it's, you know, it's all about education. And, and consistency. Um, I mean, there's the push for the moon and the, the industry to be capitalized. I think that's the same thing. It's only going to catch and become popular if people are using it and saying why they're using it. Um, so we capitalize the M and moon, um, for, for instance. And so I, I do think that perception is a big thing. Um, and so utilizing words that kind of frame your, your, your reference are very important. Um, that's why I brought up the, the images of the near side and the far side. Most people, you know, only have the near side for, for obvious reasons. Um, but most people probably couldn't even tell you that the image on the, the right is of the far side, especially if they're not within the industry. And so I think that, that that's really important is really just engaging with the, the broader community and, and world and, and, and working with them to, to make these commonplace. And Jimbo asks, could we use a form of controlled static to circulate regolith in a certain way or to keep it clear of man-made bodies? I, I know that um, uh, electrostatic, anti-static, or any form of uh, conductive energy is, is really being looked into um, for dust mitigation. I think, again, it's probably going to take multiple techniques um, in order to, to rid different surfaces. Um, I mean, fabrics are gonna be very different than um, you know, metals and, and, and plastics. And, and so I think that's gonna be extremely important is looking at what works best depending on the material, depending on the use of that material. Um, and I do think that those are gonna be extremely important. And our final question comes from Connections Live. And they ask, what about coveralls as a way of keeping dust off of spacesuits? Yeah, I mean, it's the idea of why when you go into a, a new home, um, sometimes they make you put on those little booties. Um, now, that's more to protect the house than you, um, but it's a similar idea is that it's something disposable. Um, so I think that there's definitely research being done into that. Um, what can maybe be disposable, especially if it's something that then can be reutilized and repurposed. Um, I don't think we're going to send something that's one use and then it becomes trash on the moon because that's a very expensive item, um, at least in terms of weight of, of launching it to the surface. Um, so are there in situ resources that can be utilized to, to make, you know, these products? And then what can the, the next life of the product be after it's used as a coverall? Yep, yep, that makes sense. Uh, do we have any more questions? There was one question uh, that was asked. Oh, I think, well, anyway, uh, it was about what percentage of the volatiles in the ice were organic. Oh, I did not uh, see that question. Yeah, and okay. uh, the answer is a bit tricky. It depends on what you consider organic. Um, if you go to the answered tab for the Q&A, uh, yeah, I have the answer there. So um, relative to water, uh, it depends, like I said, on what you consider organic. Um, most people would say carbon would be required. So uh, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, about 10% uh, or a little over that of the water or the ices were organic in nature. So methane, ethane, um, that sort of thing. Good catch, Vince. Thanks. No worries. All right. Well, if we don't have any more questions, we're going to wrap it up. Uh, thanks a lot, Melissa and Vince. That very interesting. Lots of good information. And uh, I want to thank all of our speakers for sharing their knowledge with us today. Great presentations. And we're uh, ending a little ahead of schedule, but I think we're just going to close down this room and break off into the networking rooms, and we'll have a little bit more time in those. So I'll see everybody there.
Thank Thanks you so much. Ben. Thanks, Ben.